No, no, no. Now, what happens in your heart when you hear those words? No, no, no. Are those words that encourage you or words that discourage you? Well, it really depends on the spelling. When the word, when the word is spelled N-O, well, that's no as a discouragement. But when the word is spelled K-N-O-W, that's a word of encouragement, a call to learn, to grow, to mature, and understand. And I don't think anyone likes to be told N-O, no. If you want to see our beautiful five-year-old daughter quickly turn ugly, just tell her no. It doesn't matter what the topic. If you say no, her face scrunches up, her hands go on the hips, and you can just kind of see the steam coming out of her ears. How dare somebody tell me no? And yet there are so many things she doesn't know. Some of the reasons why we say no. Some of the things she needs to know. Things like, no, don't run into the street when the traffic is coming. No, don't stick a fork into the electricity to see if the outlet is working. See, that's something she learned from her mom. Seriously, her mom did that as a kid. And now we had to genetically pass that on and <laughs> had to correct our kids on it too. I say, no, don't date and marry a non-believer. You said, Scott, she's five. Well, I know, but we want to get started early on some of these training things as we're talking about here. But you know, there's an important point right here, which is that the more our daughter knows, the less we have to use those no's, the less we need to say no. And what is true physically is also true spiritually. So important to see. Part of growing up in God's grace is us going from N-O to K-N-O-W. Going from no to no. And that's why I titled this teaching in Romans 6, From Knowing to Knowing. And those two alternate spellings there. Now, to take just a moment to make sure everyone understands the point of the picture that's up here on the screen, you can see clearly it's a little scooter with a Harley Davidson sticker on it. Now, some would say that's just sacrilege right there, you know? It, but really, that's a picture of powerlessness, isn't it? It's somebody kind of pretending, maybe some wishful thinking there. And in the same way, it seems that many Christians live kind of powerless lives, kind of putt-putt lives, kind of maybe a little bit less than God promised even. And maybe their life comes to more make-believe than reality when it comes to spiritual things. And as we all know, sticking a sticker on a scooter does not make it a motorcycle. And in the same way, sticking a Christian sticker on your car, it doesn't make you a Christian. Putting on a Christian t-shirt, it doesn't make you any different on the inside. And see, the book of Romans really wanted to go to the inside, written about reality, not wishful thinking, but as Romans 1 says, Paul called the gospel the power of God. Now, that's a lot of power. That's an amazing amount of power. There's no powerlessness in the gospel. The gospel of God, the power for salvation. And Romans 6, 7, and 8, these chapters here, these central chapters, I believe, are some of the most powerful passages that you'll find anywhere in the Bible. And if we know these pages, if we really know them, not just intellectually, not just maybe in our mind or there on the page, but really put them into our lives, into our hearts, into our practice, we're going to be living lives to the full, just as Jesus promised, just as he said that we would. And so we see we need to go beyond a religion of no, 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 and on to no, no, no. Know the one who is going to give us this power. And so many Christians, I do believe, they think of Christianity really in terms of no, no, no. Rules and regulations, limitations and laws, all the things of life forbidden that are fun. A giant red circle with the cross through it there, the line through it over every pleasure in life. As God says to us, no, 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 no. And so God there as the cosmic cop just waiting to slap those Holy Spirit handcuffs on us and keep us from having any kind of enjoyment in life. No, no, you can't do that. No, 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 no. No, you're a Christian. You can't do that. And so often the religious people of the world, I believe they kind of perpetuate that perspective. Their witness to the world is no, no, no. You shouldn't be doing that. You can't be doing that. Frowning at them and saying, do you know Jesus? And they say, no. 
I don't want to know him. Not the way you know him anyway. And grace seems so very dangerous to many. You see, it was true in Paul's day. It's really true in ours. What if for a moment the book of Romans was really true? What if, in fact, God does give grace to sinners? What if, in fact, God does forgive people freely who put their faith in Jesus Christ? What if it is really the way to salvation, simply to believe in the one that God sent? What would happen to holiness then if people preach God's grace? What would happen? Chaos, I'm sure. And see, that was a major concern of the critics in Paul's day. And there were many that wanted to go against the gospel of God. And so as Paul preached this gospel of grace, legalists everywhere called him to account. They said, wait a minute, it can't be this way. No, 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 Paul. It can't be true. Eternal life can't be that easy. No, no, no. See, if you give people grace, people will feel free to sin. People will just say yes, yes, yes to ungodliness. We'd better keep telling them no, 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 no. We better keep them in law. We, in line, we got to lay down the law. You got to tell them you can't do this and you can't do that. That's what religion is all about. And so the Apostle Paul really answered those concerns, those objections, those questions, beginning here in Romans chapter 6. And I'll give you a quick summary of the chapter, and then we'll look at it verse by verse as we go through it. Paul's primary pro point there in Romans 6 is we all need to know, know, know that Christianity is so much more than just no, no, no. See, the reality of the spiritual life is not about no, no, no all the time. It's about knowing all the time that God has a purpose and plan in anything he says, whether it's yes, no, maybe, wait, later, any of the things that he says. See, N-O is all about external rules, where someone is telling you from the outside, this is the way it's going to be. But K-N-O-W... That's the relationship that we have with Christ, where he can tell us from the inside what's going on and why. That internal relationship, such a difference, a crucial difference. It's the thing that differentiates Christianity from all other approaches to God. And it makes it the one and only way, really, to come into contact with God. See, Romans 6 is all about knowing. That word is all throughout the chapter. And Paul is pointing out for us Four foundational facts that we need to know, that every believer needs to know. And again, we'll look at each one of these more in depth as we go through the chapter. But the first one is found in verse 3, if you're taking notes. And it's know that you are one with Christ. If you are a Christian, if you have put your faith in him, you are united with Christ. One in the eyes of God with his son. Immersed in him, soaked with him. And you see that first, a very important thing to know. But then the second one is found in verse 6. As we progress through the chapter, it's know that you died to sin. Now, I know right away some people say, well, wait a minute. I know Jesus died for sin. Well, that is true. And that is a foundational fact. But really, Paul's going beyond that. And he's saying, you know what? You died to sin. You don't have to serve sin. You don't have to have sin as your master. Now, some would say right away, you mean sinless perfection? Because I'm falling far short of that. Yes, and you always will. But here's the thing. We can be a new creation in Christ. It's been said, I'm not what I will be, but thank God I am not what I was. That's what he's saying here, that you died to sin. And then you see in verse 9, you can know that you are alive to God. That it doesn't just stop with you being dead to something but again, alive to someone. What an amazing opportunity that gives us. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead physically is at work right now in the life of anyone who has Jesus, has their Lord and Savior. Hey, that power that raised a man from the dead, three days dead, is available in our lives today spiritually. What an amazing thing that is to know. And then you see verse 16, toward the end of the chapter, it says that we can know that we now have a new master. See, we can choose to have a different Lord in our life. It used to be that we had sin as our slave master, but now a different opportunity. And we see in that section that sin always enslaves. 
it enslaves, it separates, it ruins relationships. Our relationship with God, our relationship with others. But we can have a different master. And because of that, we can become his masterpiece. Now, quickly reviewing the first five chapters. It's that our past is past. See, we have passed on past chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And you may have seen in some of those chapters a pretty dark picture painted but also some rays of light, and now it really gets light as we go into these chapters here. Positionally, what we saw in those first five chapters, we are free from the eternal penalty of sin. What is that? The eternal penalty of sin is death. See, even if someone gets away with sin, this side of death, oh, if they have not repented, if they are not in a right relationship with God, well, there will be an eternal penalty for that, and that's sin separating us from God forever. But that's what we see is that we are free if we have our faith in Christ from that penalty. Justification is what the Bible calls that. And it puts it in the past tense in chapter 5. It says, having been justified. So it's over. It's done. It's something that God has finished and completed. And last week in Romans 5, that's exactly what we saw. Our salvation, not based on our righteous acts, so-called, but on one righteous act of one man for all other men. You see that with Jesus dying there on the cross. And so that's salvation, justification brought to us. But many would say at that point, okay, now what? Maybe some of you are people who have given your lives to the Lord recently here in this room. And to some extent you're thinking, okay, I've arrived. I'm there. I'm done. I'm saved. Well, in a sense, yes, that's an arrival, but it's also a journey. And what you're seeing there is that practically God wants to set us free from the ongoing power of sin in our lives. He wants us to walk in newness of life. He wants to give us a new life here, not just eternal life somewhere out there after we die, but no, abundant life now. That's what the Bible talks about. And you might ask yourself, how do I have that? How do I experience that? Well, again, religion will give you a set of rules. And most of them, no. In O, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Give up all these things, and then you will be in right relationship. But you know what? Romans 6 preaches relationship. K-N-O-W. Know Jesus. Know his character. Know his love. Know his power in your life. And you know, as we see what he has done for us and what he is doing for us, oh, when we K-N-O-W Jesus, there's going to be plenty of yeses, plenty of no's, plenty of maybes, plenty of answers maybe that we've never even thought of as we have that real relationship with God that takes us so far beyond what religion could do. And see, when we know Jesus, we have that power and we can embrace those truths and we can be free not only from the penalty of sin, which is a huge thing, but free practically from the power of sin controlling our thoughts and our actions and the way our lives are lived. Because sin is bad. Even forgiven sin still hurts. It still makes messes of lives. And so God wants to set us free, not just from the penalty, which is a massive thing, but from the power of sin. And that's the section that we enter here in the book of Romans. If you look with me at verse 1 of chapter 6, this is what it says. What shall we say then? As a result of everything that we've heard already in chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. He says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know? See, this question is going to be asked throughout this chapter. Do you not know? Or he says, you need to know this. And so the first one we see right there, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, again, last chapter, if you just glance back on your pages there, Romans 5.20, it says where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. And right away, because of the sinfulness of man, so many would react right away to that and say, oh, I've got an idea then. Great. The more I sin, the greater God's grace, right? Hey, I've got it all logically figured out. A way to justify my sin justify myself that has nothing to do with God's justification. See, that's when Paul says, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, N-O. There's something you need to know. 
What is it we need to know? He says, well, do you not know it? That there in verse 3, it says Jesus died for our sins on the cross. And we say, yeah, I know that. But the way we know that is because the Bible tells us that. But, you know, the Bible tells us so much more than even that. So many Christians kind of stop there. Hey, my sins are forgiven. Okay, I guess I can go on with my life. No, that's the whole thing is we need to know so much more than that. Another truth, which is that we died to sin when Jesus died there on the cross. How do I know that? Well, the same faith that tells me, the same word of God that tells me that Jesus died for my sin tells me that I died to sin. I died to sin? I didn't know that. Well, we need to know that. See, Christians, many times they are forgiven positionally, and yet they go on sinning without the knowledge, without the understanding, without the ability even that God gives in his grace to say no to sin in the power of the spirit. And see, the problem is that so often we don't really know the truth that sets us free. Jesus said, hey, if you abide in my truth, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And a great question to ask yourself tonight is, am I free? Am I free? Oh, it's great to ask the question, first of all, am I saved? Do I have that faith in Jesus that saves me? But beyond that, am I free? Practically, am I free from the kinds of attitudes and behaviors and things that are really holding me back from being all that God would want me to be? See, we really need to believe all that the Bible has to say for us. And Jesus died for my sin, and that's awesome. But the Bible says, I died to my sin. How did I die to sin? Well, that's the thing we need to know, number one. Number one, if you're taking notes, it's that we are one with Christ. See, that's a unity that took place there when we believed in him. The Bible uses the analogy all throughout for believers of that of marriage. And marriage, the Bible says the two become one. We've been talking about that on Sundays, about what it is to really form that oneness in relationship. And yet that's the very analogy that God uses for our relationship with him, saying, hey, there's a unity when you come into that relationship with me. And so what he's saying there is that what is true of Jesus, God considers it to be true of you. And see, when Jesus died, it's like God says, okay, by your association with him, you died also. First verses there, it talks about water baptism. And it's great because as was announced, we're going to be having a water baptism in July, July 15th, and you'll wanna mark that down. But what is water baptism? Sometimes there's a lot of confusion on this, but I like to just call it a funeral for my flesh. Many of you, maybe even in this room, remember my funeral. I, I was baptized a while back. Some of you were there. And you could say, hey, we went to your funeral. It was wonderful. But, you know, what's great about that funeral for your flesh is that there's newness of life on the other side. The Christian life begins with a death. See, that's important to know. The old you dying. So every... Christian life begins with that death, a death of the old self, a burial there. And that's really what is being symbolized by baptism. It's not just a ritual or a rite with no rhyme or reason to it. No, God knew exactly what he was doing when he asked us to do this, when he told us to do this. In verse 3, the word there that says baptized, you were baptized into Christ and baptized into the faith there, it's talking about the word which means immersed, to be soaked in something. And see, in those days, they would use that word actually in a non-religious context for what you would do when you soaked a piece of cloth into a vat of dye there. And it would take on the color and characteristics of the dye. You know, as you're making something a certain color and you're putting it in there, well, it'd go in one way and it'd come out a different way. And so that's what it's saying there, a complete identification with Christ, taking on his characteristics, soaked in him, immersed in him, one with him, identified with him. So that's a truth that if you don't know it already, we need to know it, that we are one with Christ if we believe in him. In God's eyes, the two are becoming one. And you see, baptism, it's an outward expression there of an inward change. It's not what saves anyone. Sometimes people will say something to the contrary. But you know, it's a symbol. It's an important symbol, but it's a symbol and nothing more and nothing less. And I like to use the example of a wedding ring. I have mine right here. And as I think about that, you know, it's a symbol. 
but it's not what makes me married. See, I'm married, but it, I, it doesn't have anything to do at the end of the day with whether or not I have this ring or I don't. Now, I might get in trouble if I lost it, but you know, I need to wear that. I want to wear that. But I could wear this ring and not be married. You know, if one of you took it and you put it on your finger, it doesn't mean you're married to my wife. Sorry, it's not that simple. But also, as you think about this, I could not wear the ring and still be married. So it's just a symbol. But it's an important one, and I like having it there. I like to look at it at times and remind myself what it means, a real relationship. And by the way, as you think about that, water baptism here, it's just a picture painted of a spiritual reality, of that same kind of relationship there. And if you haven't been baptized or you don't remember it or it didn't have significance to you, it's something to really seriously consider there in July because it has a meaning, it has a purpose, and God commanded it with that purpose. Old man dead, a funeral for your flesh, new man resurrected and living. And see, as you think about that, Paul's reminding them, and he's using that example there to say, you know, you know what this is about. You see the result of this. We are one with Christ. We're identifying with him in his death in his burial, and his resurrection. And so he goes on in verse 4 to say, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also, note this, walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together, you might want to circle that little section there where it says united together. That's what it's talking about, that unity, that oneness in the likeness of Christ's death certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, when a person's water baptized, if you've ever been there, you know they come out physically different, right? They go in wet, I mean, go in dry, and they come out wet. Now, some would say, yeah, they go in looking great, they come out looking like a, a drowned rat or whatever. But that's not really true. See, I've never seen anyone who looked better going in than coming out. I've done a lot of them, and I've been at a lot of them, and you know, it's just an amazing thing even to see the look on people's face when they come out. Now, part of it's the fact that sometimes the water's a little cold, but in July, it should be reasonably warm. But you know what's going on there is that there is a physical thing happening, but I believe that God is spiritually showing us through that, hey, we never hold somebody under. Pedro said it many times, we never just wait for the bubbles to stop, you know, put them under and blah, blah, blah. Anyone heard anything lately? No, we may hold them a little while, but then the person comes up. We haven't lost one yet. And so you see Jesus there, he went to death on the cross, on the cross, but he didn't stay dead. This is the foundational fact of our belief that he's alive. And see, so many people say, well, that's great for him, but what about me? And that's the very point. We're one with him. When we baptize people, we're lifting them up, not just putting them down. Identify, identification with Christ. And so Jesus there, he was dead, he was buried, but the best part came when he came out of that grave different. And so that's what he's saying there. We are one with him, united together. That word comes from gardening. That's the picture being painted there in verse 5. It says being grafted into something. I don't know if you've ever done that where you've taken a really good root, a, a plant that is doing really well, and you graft something into it, and it bears much more fruit that way. And that's what's happening there is you're taking that new root, you're taking that grafting in, and much fruit is born. And that's what he's talking about, newness of life, where you go into that root of Jesus Christ, united together with him. And it's amazing the life that comes out of that. And so the more you know, the more you know of these truths, but the more you know about the author of these truths, the more you really know him, just not knowing about him, but knowing him, the more you will grow. The more you know, the more you will grow. And that's why Paul says we need to know this, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So that's the thing we need to know, number two there. We died to sin. We died to sin. When we came to Christ, we died to sin. The old man, the natural self, it wasn't reformed. It wasn't a little bit better. It's I'll try a little harder. It's talking there about crucif crucifixion. Or, yeah, that's not a word. Crucifying. Crucifixion. 
And crucifixion, I kind of like it. Maybe we'll use it. But it's saying there that that has been done in your life. I don't know if you knew this, but you have been crucified with Christ. When he was crucified because of that identification, hey, we died also. And the Bible says that what we need to do is reckon that so. We need to trust that. We need to know it. We need to believe it. The same way that we put our faith in the fact that Jesus died for our sin, we need to believe the Bible when it says that we have died to sin. Died to the power of sin to lead our life for us. And see, believing that doesn't make it true. It's true. And that's why we need to believe it. Again, it's not wishful thinking. It's not kind of pumping up your ideas so that you're uh, just kind of making your own reality. No, it's bringing our thoughts and our attitudes and our actions and our faith and our trust into alignment with what God says is true. See, he says right there, it's not make-believe. It's not like sticking a Harley sticker on a scooter and saying, there, I got a mean machine. No. It's this, it's the power of God in the gospel. See, God gave a powerful gift when he gave us the gift of salvation. It's the gift that transforms you. See, when I think about this, I give my kids gifts sometimes at Christmas or their birthday or maybe even just for no reason. But I never give them a gift that doesn't work. You know, I, if I want to make my life miserable, that's what I do. Give them a gift with no batteries in it or a broken thing or whatever. I don't do that. I give them gifts that work, gifts that are working there as designed, and that's what the gospel is. It's a powerful gift for transformation. You see Galatians 2.20 gives the same idea of crucif <laughs> crucifixion, I almost said it again, of being crucified with Christ. It says there in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified. This is Paul talking. He hadn't been crucified yet physically, but he's talking about the spiritual reality of it. He says, my identification is so complete with him that I have been crucified with him. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And this is what it says. And the life that I now live, I live in the flesh by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And notice that he's saying, I was crucified, but guess what? I'm living a life. I'm not dead. I'm dead to my old way of life. And I'm alive to a new a new way of life, which is the life of Christ in me. Now, verse 6, it talks about the body of sin being done away with. And that word means to be put out of business or to be rendered inoperable. And you see uh, verse 7 talking about this also, and it's kind of a gross example in a way, but hey, stick with me because it's, it's really something that, that you see him talking about here. If a person is dead, they really don't have the same kind of maybe relationship to certain things in life as they would have otherwise. A person who, for example, is an alcoholic. Well, maybe these days they wouldn't be able to resist a drink or they would always be there at the party. But imagine them dying now from that disease, dying from that, dying from that decision there, and they have the open casket and a drinking buddy comes by and says, hey, you want one? Pops the top, but what's going to happen? Is the person there who's dead going to sit up and say, yeah, I was hoping someone would have some at my funeral. No, it's not going to happen that way. Why? Because they're dead to sin. There's a deadness there that wasn't there before. Now, again, the Bible says we need to reckon it so. What does that mean? It's not always going to feel that way. But he says, but you know what? Our, our whole Christian life wasn't supposed to be built on feelings anyway. So there's days I don't feel saved. You know, you wake up in the morning, if someone said, do you feel saved? I don't feel saved. I feel lost. And I feel like a heathen today. But that doesn't mean that suddenly your salvation is in question simply because of your feelings. No. And that's what he says. You have to reckon it. You have to believe it. You have to trust it. You have to know that it's true. And so he says here in verse 8, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing this, again, that verse 9 there, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death there longer, therefore no longer has dominion over him. The word dominion means control. And it says, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And then this again is where it identifies us with him. It's not just talking about Jesus. Because sometimes we think all these things are true of Jesus. But the Bible makes it so clear that with our identification with him, 
we are one with him, they also become true of us. You see it saying that, that in verse 11, likewise you also reckon yourself to be dead, indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That, so that's the third thing that I said we need to know if we're ever going to live the kind of life that Jesus promised to us. Number three there, it was that we are alive to God. So first of all, we knew that we are one with Christ, then we see dead to sin, that's an important one, but alive to God. And he says there to reckon yourself dead to sin. And as I've said before, I lived in Texas for a while, and we used to say reckon all the time. I reckon it'll rain. I reckon it won't. You know, I reckon this, I reckon that. And that's why we'd always use that. But remember, this is Saul of Tarsus, not Saul of Texas. And so there's a different meaning here as he's saying reckon. What it really means is just simply this, to account something, to impute it, to consider it this way and to believe that it is this way. It's the same word that was used earlier in the chapter for reckoning you righteous, that Jesus would look at you and say, yes, that's a righteous person because of their faith. If you write down Romans chapter 4, verse 3, that's where you see him saying that, that it was accounted to him as righteousness. Same word there. And it's a word of faith. It's a word of belief. It's a word of trusting that what God's word says is true. And again, it's not true because we believe it. It's true, and so we need to believe it. We need to come to understand it and know it, because if we don't know it, it can't have the effect on us that it's supposed to. And so he's saying there, you know what? We need to believe and agree with God, that we would reckon the same thing true in our life that God says is true in our life. And, you know, God would look at my life and say, Scott, I do reckon that you are righteous. I reckon you righteous. And so all I need to do is say, God, I, I reckon you're right. And he says, you know, I reckon you're dead to sin. And well, I, I reckon you're right. And I may not always feel dead to sin. In fact, sometimes it feels very much alive. But I don't always feel forgiven of sin. And yet the Bible says that I am because of Christ. And so by faith, that's what we need to do. Reckon ourselves righteous and reckon that the very thing that God says when he says you're dead to sin, that it is true. Alive to God, his life in me, believing that to be true, knowing it to be true. The Bible says Christ in you, the hope of glory. Isn't that a far cry from a set of external rules of no, 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 don't do this, don't do that. No, it's Christ in me. That's the hope of glory, that he would be influencing me from the inside out. That sometimes I would say no to something and realize, wow, that was the power of Christ in me. The resurrection power of Christ. That's what he's talking about with new life. We died with him. We're raised to life in him. And that's what you see him talking about that section. Now, I took an airplane flight this last week. And... It made me think of this aviation analogy, which is that as you're there at the airport, I don't know if you've ever had to wait for a little while, you start looking at these planes and they start looking very heavy. And then you start looking at the people who are carrying the massive bags, you know what I'm talking about, where it's just one after the other and they're overstuffed and everything. And, and you think, I don't think I could lift that bag at all. And then you begin to think, all those bags are going on the plane I'm going on. And all these people are going on the plane that I'm going on. And that plane looks heavy all by itself. And you start thinking, there's no way this thing's going to get off the ground. You start thinking, oh, no, 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 no. This isn't going to work. There's no way this can work. And you know, as well as I do, that gravity is a very strong force, right? It's an extremely strong force. And if you don't believe me, just try to flap your arms and fly. I mean, just, you know, no matter how much you do it, it's just not going to help. And, and you start thinking, well, you know, what, is this thing going to get off the ground? Will it stay off the ground? All that kind of stuff. But you know what? I was able to get on that plane because I know something. I know something. I know, no, no, from experience and from a little bit of school that I paid attention to that I can say yes, yes, yes to getting on that plane. Why? It will fly because there are two forces. And there's a force that's even more powerful under certain conditions than gravity, and that's aerodynamics. Aerodynamics is how the plane flies. Now, if you don't know how it works, it's that the top of the wing is curved and the bottom is straight. 
Now, I know there's jet engines and all that, but you know what? You can go really, really fast and still not fly. It's, it's that aerodynamic principle that makes something fly. The, the air goes a little bit faster over the top, and it creates a lift that picks that huge plane and all of those you know, clothes that nobody's actually going to wear on the trip and all that kind of stuff that you think, well, I've got to have it. It lifts it up. And here's the thing to remember. Gravity is not gone. Gravity is still just as there as it's ever been. Don't think about that too much while you're there in the plane. <laughs> but it's been overcome by a more powerful principle. See, gravity is not gone, but aerodynamic lift has taken the superior position at that point. And it's rendered gravity, in essence, ineffective. The plane flies. But you know what? If for a moment that is interrupted, there will be a loss of altitude. And you see in there that there's a spiritual principle. Let me see if I can connect a few dots there that you see sin like that gravity there. It holds us earthbound. It holds us to the flesh. It drags us down and it keeps us so focused in on the physical things sometimes that we think, I don't know how this life is ever going to get off the ground. Could I ever really be free to fly in the spiritual sense like you see in the scriptures and you see maybe an example in your life that somebody else seems to just have, wow, this ability to overcome and you're just always so earthbound. Well, I know what I'll do. I'll flap a little harder. And again, as we've seen the scriptures, the Bible says, no, 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 no. You need to understand a principle. You need to understand something. You need to know, no, no, the things that are found in Romans 6 and 7 and 8. You need to see these things in here, that there's a spiritual lift that's given by God's grace, and it's right here, which is reckoning yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. That when that temptation comes, you say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm dead. I can't be tempted by that. I, I'm not going to go that way. I'm dead. I'm alive to Christ right now. I'm sorry, I just can't do that. And so you start seeing that, and all of a sudden you go, huh, I'm getting off the ground. I can't believe it. I'm starting to have some altitude in my spiritual life. And again, even as Peter did when he was walking there on the water, so often what happens is we begin to think again about gravity and all of those things, and we go down again. But see, remember, gravity isn't gone. It's not going to be gone in our life. Sin is not eradicated in that sense that we will never have that pull on our lives. But you know what? Our faith in God can give us a superior a superior force in our life. The support there, the lift there in our life. And that's just like the power of aerodynamic lift, a very, very strong thing. And it's knowing these things that we've talked about tonight, knowing that we are one with Christ. See, when I remember I'm one with Christ, oh, wait, that, that changes a lot of things in life, doesn't it? When I know that, not just up here, but in my heart, I know that He is in me, and working through me, and has promised never to leave or forsake me, hey, I am one with him. That does a lot. Knowing that I died to sin, when I can say, you know what? The old Scott is dead, and I'm going to reckon it that way, and I'm not going back that way, and that chapter of my life is closed, and I'm just not going back there again. I pass through that door to life, and I live in the power of God knowing that we live to God. And you know what? The truth is, when we know certain things, there are things we're going to say no to. But it's a whole different thing because it's not somebody on the outside saying, you got to say no to that. But I want to say yes to it. It's something inside you saying, oh, I want to say no to that. And in the power of God, I'm going to say no to that. And I want to say yes to this. And in the power of God, I'm going to say yes to that. You see that in verse 12, he says, Therefore, because of all these things he's discussed, he says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. See, that's a choice word there, isn't it? Don't let this happen. That means anyone who says that, well, once you're a Christian, you never have the pull of sin anymore. Not true. Gravity's not gone. It's still there, but it can be overcome by the Spirit. And so he says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Now, what he's talking about there when he talks about your members and your instruments, he's talking about your body parts. 
He's saying all you really are is an instrument, and you're either going to be in God's hands or you're going to be in Satan's hands. Those are really the two choices. And I don't know if you've ever seen it. You know, there's some instruments up here. Have you ever seen it when somebody gets behind an instrument and you think, man, I need a guitar like that. That's an awesome guitar. That guy played so well. And then you get the same guitar and you go, man, I stink. I need a new guitar. That's what I need. And you realize, hey, the player has a little something to do with it. Now, the instrument has some influence, of course, but the player can make something very special that seems very ordinary. And that's what you see in the hands of God. A person's life can be so different than when they're presenting their life, their instrument, their members to someone else. And you see here it talks about it. It means you can look at your hands, you know, maybe take a moment to do that. Look at your hands and realize, hey, these are holy hands. Holy hands. Now, some, thing, some people think that means I better not get them too dirty. And so, you know, if the, your wife at home asks you to take out the trash, hey, these are holy hands. We don't do that, you know. I'm reading the Bible here. But you know what? It's amazing. Actually, it takes a whole lot more holy hands to take that trash out with the right attitude than it does maybe to sit down and read the Bible. But think about that. That if I were to take those holy hands and go out to get the garbage, instead of taking the garbage out, what do you think my wife would think of that? What do you think Lynn would say to me? Honey, what are you doing out there? Just getting the garbage. <laughs> getting the garbage? What do you mean? Well, I wanted to bring it back in the house. I really miss it. You know, there was a bunch of stuff that I, I just, I miss that stuff. See, holy hands, what do they do? They take out the garbage. They won't take in the garbage. And that's what he's kind of saying here is don't use your life to... Just take in garbage through your eyes and your ears and everything in our life. Hey, we take in holy things. And he says, the reason is our body, it's, it's not for dishonor. That was your old body. That one died. Remember, he said you were dead to sin. You died when Jesus was crucified there. You're crucified with him. He says you have a new life. And that body is for holy things, for godly things. And see, this body now, well, I can say there are things that I say, I, I just don't do that anymore. Why? Because that was for the old dead body, but the alive to body, the alive to God body, one with Jesus, dead to sin, alive to Christ. That's what he's talking about here. And then he says, verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. I love to look at verses in their context, and we're seeing it here tonight. That's one that I've heard half of that verse very often, you know, and I sometimes say, some of you have heard me say it, there's nothing worse than half a verse because people will just take something right out of context and say, hey, I'm not under law, but under grace. And they use that as a justification for why they're about to sin or why they sinned and it really doesn't matter because, hey, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. But look at it in its context. He says, sin shall not have a dominion over you. It shouldn't control you. It's not the thing that's going to live your life for you because you're not under law, but under grace. You're not under gravity, you're living your life under that aerodynamic principle of walking in the Spirit, in newness of life, letting the wind of the Holy Spirit lift us up, not drag us down. And so if you ask yourself that honest question, hey, am I losing the war with sin? I mean, practically. Am I going down, 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 down like that? Does sin have com control and dominion over my life? Well, maybe you've heard people, or maybe you've even said it. Oh, I can stop at any time. Say, well, why don't you? Well, I don't want to. See, a big part of it is the want to. The want to that gets in alignment with Christ and his character. And many think the sin cycle can be broken, maybe through a, a resolving there, a, a New Year's resolution, or I'm going to be a little different here. But you know what? The Bible makes it clear that the sin cycle is actually fed by law. That if someone's always telling you, no, 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 then you start going, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to do whatever I want. Rebellion rises up in us. You think about it this way, a wet paint sign. What does it make you want to do? It says, do not touch. And you go over there and I'll show you. you know? <laughs> There's just something about that. Do not walk on grass. And you can walk on to go see the sign. You know, And it's just something in us that makes us want to do that. But that's the reason why God said it's not going to be about law between us. It's going to be about love. And when you know, no, no, the love of God, it causes you to make different choices. 
when you know the grace of God, it has a different perspective in our life that we begin to see things the way he does. And that's the thing we need to know, number four. He talks in here about the fact that we are going to serve someone. We will serve some master in life. There will be something that will master our life. And which master we choose will affect us very practically day to day. It'll make a radical difference in our life. And so he says there in verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Certainly not. This is the second time he said no, 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 no in this chapter. But he's also saying because we need to know. We need to know a different way of looking at God. Shall we take a light view of sin? That's what he's saying. Shall we view it lightly because we're under grace now? It's no big deal? He says no, 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 no. You know, we are going to serve someone. We will have a master. And he goes on to say, we are slaves to the one we obey. When we sin, sin is our master. And there's a lot of people who say, well, I do whatever I want. You know, I don't have to listen to God. All that's showing is that they are a slave to sin. Nobody's really a self-governing person. No, if you're not governed by God, the Bible makes it very clear you're governed Governed by the enemy of your soul. Sin is our master. And to disobey God is to obey Satan. It's just that simple. There's only two choices there. And so a choice to sin is a choice to stay in slavery. It always enslaves us. Sin does. And even forgiven sin makes a mess of our lives. It hurts people that we love. It hurts us. And most of all, you see, it hurts God. And sometimes Satan will come and tempt us, and he'll say, go ahead and sin, man. God's grace will cover it. Just like it says here, oh, you can go on and sin. You're not under law. You're under grace. But I hope we know way too much to fall for that, to fall for that lie. It's not true. What would you think of a prisoner who was in a cell, and the door was open, the locks are broken, the shackles are taken away, the sentence has been removed, the price been paid now, they're free, and they stay in the cell? What, what are you doing? What are you doing? You would want to yell to them, don't you know? Don't you know that you're free? And that's what Paul is saying here so plainly for us. Don't you know? Don't you know that you're free? And those of you who know the history of this country as it relates to slavery, well, the Emancipation Proclamation came out, and that made all slaves free. But not all slaves were free practically. Oh, you see, what happened is that so many stayed in the pattern that they were familiar with. They maybe didn't know or understand even fully that, no, you're free. You can go now. The old life does not have to be the new life. And see, some of them stayed in that slavery just simply because it was familiar. And so many people do that even in Christianity. Jesus says, hey, the chains are gone. The power of sin is broken in your life. You don't have to have sin as your master anymore. You don't have to be the way you were. I know you might say, well, I was born this way. But you can be born again a different way. You don't have to be that way anymore. It's a choice that we make the master. And Paul wanted us to know that. And so he says there in verse 16, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart. See, that's where it all comes back, to that heart issue, that the form of doctrine to which you were delivered. In other words, he's saying, you know, you knew in your heart the truths that were in your head. They weren't just in your head. They were in your heart, and they led to obedience. And he says, and having been set free from your sin, you became slaves of righteousness. See, grace very much sets us free. Absolutely it does. But so many get this wrong because they think it means it's a freedom to sin. But it's a freedom from sin because sin is slavery. See, we need to learn this group here of equations, spiritual equations, ministry math here. It's sin equals suffering. Very simple uh, equation there. Sin equals suffering. Sin equals slavery. Those are the things we need to know. Just as sure as hot burner equals pain. See, as a young kid, sometimes parents have to say, no, 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 because we don't know, no, no, that you hit that hot burner, it's going to burn you. 
But I know that. No one has to say that to me. No, no, no. I, you know, as I'm making dinner or something or a snack, Lynn doesn't have to come in and say, no, 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 Scott. Don't touch the hot burner because you know that will burn you. Oh, I want to. You know, she, she doesn't have to do that anymore. Why? Because I know. After the first five or six times, I figured it out. <laughs> and see, Satan tries to make sin so desirable, so pleasurable. He rewrites the equation. He says, no, sin equals fun. Ah, yes, that's what you really want. But it's a lie. And if we know that, it breaks the power of sin. Suddenly, we don't have that same illusion and delusion that there's going to be pleasure found in that thing. Maybe pleasure for a season. The Bible says that doesn't deny it. But it says, hey, you don't want to have the price tag of it. See, and when we know that and when we know him, when we know Christ and we see what sin did to him, what did it do to him? It put him on a cross. Well, suddenly it doesn't look so attractive anymore. And those of you who fish know that a good lure always hides the hook, right? I, I doubt if any of you who like to fish just fish with a plain hook, you know, unless you're catching some really dumb fish. No, you got to put a nice juicy worm on there. Now, right away, you know, fish are kind of dumb because worms are, you know, not that attractive either. But you put a worm on that hook and, oh, that fish goes for it. And maybe their mom, little fish mom, would say, no, 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 don't do that. Oh, mom, you don't know. It looks great. But the lure is hiding that hook. And see, that's what God's word does is it exposes the hook. It takes the worm off it and says, hey, it's a hook. Don't go for it. You need to know, no, no, that sin has a hook and it's suffering. It's sorrow. And righteousness is the path to freedom. No longer a slave to sin, a slave to righteousness now. And many of you maybe know Bob Dylan, and he had some actually Christian albums. Uh, he wrote some Christian songs uh, early in his career, and one of his songs was, You're going to serve somebody, right? Do you remember that one? You're going to serve somebody. And so you think about that. He knew well what that meant. Now, I don't know who he's serving, but you see, God is the only one who sets his slaves free. He's the one who says, You know what? You are going to serve somebody, you ought to make it me because he's the one who sets his slaves, his servants, free. What does Satan do with his? Well, he, he blinds them first, promises them the, uh, the uh, world and gives them nothing in return. He binds them up and then he grinds them into powder. And you see, he pays them death. That's what the Bible says. The, the wages of sin is death. And you know what? Satan makes sure you get the paycheck on that one. And you see that God gives his servants abundant life and eternal life. That's the payment there. And so it's a good question. Who do you want to serve? Who are you serving? Who does it make sense to serve? Whose slave are you? Because the Bible says, you know what? You will be under some management. But you can have that sign over your life that says under new management. I don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. I am a slave to the Savior and he sets me free. Now I want to kind of talk real quickly about the cycle of sin in our last moments together because I think it's an important thing to really expose and, and, and take some time with it. This is the cycle of sin and maybe it'll be familiar to you from watching other people. Of course, we never get in it, but you know, I'm sure that maybe you know somebody who this might apply to. That God has given us freedom. He has given us freedom of choice and we can choose to sin. That's one of the options he gives us. And again, sometimes there's a pleasure there in it. And we have to kind of ignore the consequence. I mean, God's words make the consequence of our choices fairly clear, and usually our parents have helped in some way with that, or if we paid any attention to the consequences of different people's choices. But we look out there and we ignore the consequence. We just, ah, I look at the pleasure and I like that. And at first it feels like you're the master, and sin is your servant. Oh, man, it's serving me. This is wonderful. But after a little while, there's a thing called diminishing returns. What that is, is the pleasure isn't quite as great this time, so I need to do a little bit more of it to get that same thing that I used to have. So now I'm doing more sin for less pleasure. But if, if I do enough sin, I can maybe get myself somewhere back in the same neighborhood of enjoyment. And then you start to suffer the consequences. See, that's when the consequences start coming in. And so then sin is no longer really pleasurable. What it is now is really painful. So instead, now you're sinning kind of to dull the pain. Instead of sinning for the pleasure, now you're sinning to dull the pain. Just to kind of get yourself back to neutral, maybe. Back to the, I can face the world now a little bit. And so 
As I said, that equation becomes very, very clear there. Now the hook is exposed. That miserable moment when sin is your master and you know it and everyone else knows it and you're no longer anything but a slave to your sin. And you see, on the other hand, there's another cycle. There's a cycle of freedom, and this is what God wants to take our lives through. Romans 6, 7, and 8. What a beautiful passage of Scripture that together gives the recipe for this. And he starts here by saying, you've got to reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. You've got to know these things. And because of what you know, because you know that you're one with him, that you really are dead to sin and alive to Christ. And you can begin to choose your master. You can say no to sin. And you know what? The first time that you say no to sin, it's going to be a little painful. Maybe everybody's saying, hey, let's go out and do what the old man used to do. And you say, well, I'm kind of the new man. <clears throat> I gave my life to the Lord. Huh? I just feel a little headache or something. I better go home. You know, and, and you're going to go a different way. And maybe it's a little painful to separate out like that. But it's because of what you know. And you go home and you say, man, i got some freedom now. I don't have to do what I used to have to do. I can live a different way. And, some, and suddenly some of the fruit of righteousness begins to grow in your life. And there's love and there's joy and there's peace and there's purpose and there's gentleness and there's kindness and there's maybe even a little bit of self-control mixed in there. And you know what? You start to begin to enjoy the pleasure of God. You begin, begin to see the pleasure that God intended for us to have in life. And you know what? There's no diminishing returns on that. It just goes from glory to glory to glory, the Bible says. And you know what's happened there? You become a slave to a new master, a slave to God. God is now your master, and you're obeying him because that's what we do with our masters. But it says there he sets you free. Again, Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and boy, you'll really be in bad bondage then, and it'll just ruin your life, and you'll never have any fun. No, he said, you'll know the truth, and that truth is going to set you free. And so Paul says there in Romans 6, 19, he says, I'm using these human terms, these examples, these things like slavery to explain to you spiritual truths because he knows how weak we are because as we'll see next chapter, Paul was not writing this theoretically. He was writing it from his own experience in the Lord that we will serve somebody, but we can choose in the spirit to serve God. And the smartest thing to do is to serve the master who sets you free. And so he says there in verse 19, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness, of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. In other words, you didn't do anything right. But what fruit did you have from those things? in which you're now ashamed, for the end of those things is death. But having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you now have your fruit to holiness and the end of that everlasting life. See, I love this because when we're slaves to sin, the fruit of our lives is just rotten. Even their best efforts just seem to go for naught. It goes from bad to worse. But you know what? When we say yes, when we begin to say what, yes to God, and no to what God says no to, you know what? The, our whole perspective shifts there. We're now free by God's grace to make choices that lead to holiness, that lead to eternal life. And when you know what we know as Christians, it only makes sense to serve God, not sin. Now, our family lives in the Homestead area, and we get to see firsthand a lot of farmland and some of it's rapidly going away. But one of the great things there is you learn a lot of lessons from that. And it's a very clear lesson that this scripture here gives us. And Galatians 6 also talks about it, which is the law of the harvest, which is you reap what you sow. It's just that simple. Those who sow to the flesh, the Bible says, will reap from the flesh destruction. And those who sow to the spirit will from the Spirit, reap eternal life. And he says, don't be deceived. Galatians 6, 7, don't be deceived. Don't mock God. Don't think that it'll be some other way or that you're an exception to it. And then you see that last verse there, Romans 6, 23. And this is one to star, if it's not already in your Bible, to underline, to make sure you know it because it's an important stop on the Romans road, as they call it. And we're looking at that as we go through Romans. Romans 6, 23. 
For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, that's what I want to leave you with, that phrase, in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, it's in knowing him that all of this is true. Without him, none of this is true. But we can know those four things, that we are one with Christ if we put our faith in him, that we are dead to sin, that we're alive to Christ, and that we can now choose our master and choose a much better choice than in our natural state. Because in our natural state, we were dead to God and alive to sin. Sin was our master. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus paid the price for our sin. That's the power of the gospel. Very simple, very straightforward. Even a child can understand it. But you have to be childlike to accept it. See, it doesn't matter what you know at the end of the day. Sometimes people know, know, know a whole lot. But we have to know him. You have to know him. It's not enough to try to say no to sin and try to be a good person. You need to say yes to Jesus. And if you've never done that, I want to give you that opportunity now. You may notice that as you think about the word no, it contains the word now. And the scripture make it clear that that's the time to make that decision. What I want to do is just take a moment here. And if there's anyone here who has never made the decision to let him in inside your life, you need to do that now. You need to do that now. There's no reason to wait. There's no reason to wait and be under the mastery of sin any longer than you already have been. So I'm just going to pray a prayer. If it's your heart, pray that prayer with me. Lord, I invite you into my heart. I open my heart and my life to you. I want to say no to sin, but I want to know you. And I want these things to be true in my life. That you would forgive me of my sin, but that you would give me the strength to live the life that you have called me to. And Lord, I want to know that when I die, I will go to heaven. But before that, I want to know what it is to live in newness of life. Forgive me and give me that life. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, there will be some people down here who will be wanting to pray with you and just give you some study materials. But I want to say something quickly to those in this room who maybe have walked with the Lord maybe for a long time and you still as I talk about those things you're not sure you totally believe it you know as you say well I don't know if I'm dead to sin I mean you, everyone promised me that that would happen when I came to Christ but I still struggle with these things you know there's maybe many in this room who know the frustration and I count myself among them of trying to live the life that Jesus has called sometimes in our own strength and we're like that person trying to flap to fly and it's just not that way that's the path to failure and condemnation. That's the path to guilt. It's the way to feel like a scooter with a Harley sticker on it. Just kind of putt, putt, putting through life. Wishing and wanting, but really practically powerless. And so what I would invite us all to do is just read and reread Romans 6, 7, and 8. Read it until we believe it. Read it until we know it. Read it until we are living it. And next time you blow it, don't... Picture God with a cross look on his face and his finger in your face saying, no, no, no. Picture him on the cross with that look of love in his eyes saying, my son, my daughter, I want you to know, no, no, that I want to be one with you. That's why I died for you. I died for your sin, that you might die to your sin, that you might live to me and serve me and in that find freedom.